Welcome back to Raisina Fireside Chats. I am Maluncho Chakraborty, and I have with me a very eminent panel here to discuss the Im importance of mainstreaming SDGs in foreign policy. Let me just introduce my guests to you, Mr. Shridharan. He is the Joint Secretary of Development Partnership Administration, Ministry of External Affairs, Government, for, Government of India. Ms. Melinda Bohannon, she is the Strategy Director, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, UK. Uh, Mr. Manuel Lafour Rapnui, Head, Foreign Policy Planning, Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us. My first question is, do you think foreign ministries have tended to underplay the importance of SDGs and development policy in general in their foreign policies? I would like to start with you, ma'am. Thank you. So, and there are two things to say on this. I mean, the, the first one is um, the sustainable development goals, when they were being negotiated at the UN, were always intended to be a universal and integrated agenda, right? So. The division, if there ever was one between development, economic, trade, security, and foreign policy, to, to right from the start would have been a flawed approach. Um, you know, the 17 goals, 169 targets, if you look at them, they are as relevant to you know, good governance as they are to trade, as they are to migration, as they are to sustainability. Now, have um, foreign ministries underplayed their importance? I think the answer is sort of yes and no. So, there are some brilliant examples of the integration in foreign policy ministries and um, in, in foreign policy terms. Um, you know, gender-wise foreign policy that the Canadians have advocated, the way in which the G7 have approached the foreign and development ministers' track on global health security, on climate change. You know, and indeed many other countries in Europe and beyond have really sort of thought about and used some of the you know, key messages and the key goals in the SDGs in foreign policy terms because it's a universal agenda and particularly because emerging economies and developing countries want it there. So, so that's the yes. I think the no is that, you know, as with all industries, organizations, um, traditional ways of thinking are hard to change. And you know, certainly the foreign policy language we use the approaches, the questions we ask ourselves certainly could be a lot more integrated in practice, but that, I think just takes time. It takes cooperation between the stakeholders, sharing of experience and evidence, um, and ultimately a passion and a commitment and an understanding for what we're trying to do, right? But the leaders are really inspiring in this in this agenda, and I certainly sort of look at the G7 and I look at um, what the spring and annual meetings have just concluded, and I look at the sort of dialogue in the UN, and it, and it feels more like we are ready now for foreign ministries to really take this on in an integrated way. So. I would go with Melinda. I think I'll jump straight into the point of where we have to talk this in this prism. You know, a few weeks ago, about three, four weeks ago, I was in dot of a dot in Indian Ocean called Adu. I don't think many of our audience would have even heard of it. It's actually part of Maldives. And you have to catch a flight from Malay to go to Ardu a few hours. And then I'm there to implement. I'm uh, in charge for a couple of projects there, including water, road, and bridge. And there I'm talking to people. The management is giving me the length of the bridge and everything. When I started talking to the common people, they were talking about you know, there are four, it's an atoll, there are four islands, and uh, we are going to build a bridge for the first time in the centuries or millennia, these places are going to be connected. They are not talking of the length of the bridge. They are saying, you know, my daughter can go to that hospital. You know, and uh, we are going to do the water sanitation. Uh, the fishing is there and we can get that market here. And the resort is here, my ladies can go and get employment there. They were actually talking the SDGs. We were talking projects, right? But fortunately, in India, at least, we have never taken this project outside the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So Ministry of External Affairs has been handling this part. So in a way, there is uh, integration here from the very high level, for example, if you say International Solar Alliance, how it can help. And then coming to an area where we understand that some of the developing countries do not have the capacity to develop a concept. We have a funding to develop a concept for them so that they can get a loan, right? So we are going from there. Recently, there is a change, thanks to our uh, external affairs minister. We, I'm In a very rough way, I'm putting it this way. He says that the project should be sustainable, not only that we are spending on sustainable goals, but the project should be sustainable. So the way I interpret is that, 
So far, the countries have been focusing on finish from start to finish. But we have to go before the start, conceive the project strategy, and after the finish, how do you sustain the project? So I normally say that uh, we have been running a pregnancy ward. Now we have to run a pediatrician ward also. The project has to be sustainable. So I think in that way, when, when she used the word integrated, universal, I will go by what my minister recently said that the indivisibility of the human existence. And if we capture that, we are all like islands, right? On the top, we will look very different. But at the deep level, we are all connected. Similarly, I think SDG goals and the development partnership, foreign policy, everything is deeply connected. We have to refocus it, look at it, and then speak the language. That is very important. Thank you. Um, I, I maybe can add two things. I, I don't know if the glass is half full or half empty, but clearly it's filling up. Um, I have the same experience. Um, and, and if uh, so, we are just ending a presidential term in France. Jean-Yves Le Drian has been a minister for the last five years. I think he has spent uh, uh, as much time and, and energy on security and political issues that he thought he would. Uh, but probably uh, he has spent uh, uh, much more time on global affairs and development and sustainable developments than he thought uh, he would. And, and certainly he spent a lot of time on the interconnection and the interdependencies on the two. Um, and if you go at the head of state uh, level, uh, President Macron had uh, uh, the SDGs as one of the priority of, of the G7 presidency with the summit in, uh, in Biarritz and that really has been part of, uh, of the agenda. Of course, that's my second and last point. Uh, there is the bureaucratic uh, difficulties that Melinda has mentioned. Maybe I would add that there is also the change in the international environment where you have this weaponization of interdependencies, you have uh, the, the growing importance of geoeconomics, you have uh, soft power, which is slowly morphing into sharp power, uh, uh, feeding into hard power with coercion and corruption being uh, other kind of influence strategies. Um, and, and that raises question about up to which point for all donors, for instance, the fight against poverty uh, really is the key purpose of uh, development assistance. So you have that kind of change in the environment where it's not just that with COVID, uh, SDGs have uh, uh, stalled or even backtracked, uh, or that uh, uh, growth uh, is key to uh, fulfilling the SDGs, SDGs, achieving them. But it's also the, the, this kind of geopolitical context which uh, makes it probably a bit more difficult. It also stresses that SDGs are very geopolitical. They should not be fulfilled or pursued only out of geopolitical motives, but not achieving SDGs would have huge geopolitical consequences. You've raised some very, very important points, and my second question actually leads from where uh, you've left. Given the times that we are in, of course, uh, we've seen SDGs, uh, a total reversal in many instances in many of the developing countries. Uh, development has actually not just stalled, we've uh, lost many of the gains that we've made in the past. Mm -hmm. So what role can foreign policy and international development partnerships make in achieving the SDGs in, in the very short span that we have till 2030. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, so picking up those, those threads, which I think are absolutely right. So, so two things. I mean, firstly, we really need to understand better than ever the connection points between what have previously been sort of quite siloed themes in foreign policy. So development, economics, and security. You know, the last few years have shown that it's very hard to divide these things. So the COVID-19 pandemic was simultaneously a development challenge, an economic challenge, a supply chain security challenge, and ultimately a security challenge um, for everybody. Um, but not just that. I mean, if you look at climate change and the environment, again, it's very hard to say, is this a development theme? Is it an economic diversification and investment theme? Or fundamentally, is it a security theme? And that repeats, I think, to a lesser extent or to a greater extent across most of the SDGs. But we all need to invest now in understanding those connection points, stop trying to bracket or sort of bucket these different things and really understand the connection points between the themes and the policy responses to them. But the second thing is, and I do think this is as important, is breaking down the silos between international and domestic. So particularly for the UK, but I think for many countries, in fact all countries, we have learned that 
you know, our foreign policy is only as strong as a public consent underpinning what we're doing internationally. And our public policies are only as strong as our international connections and our ability to serve our domestic audience. You know, and, and globalization and all the challenges that we've talked about, um, supply chain security, uh, the, the reversal or the, the, the move back or the swing back from globalization as a popular theme. You know, all of these issues are fundamentally interconnected. So, I mean, ideally in the future, we stop talking about foreign policy in a way that we talked about it 10, 20 years ago and recognize that the situation and the challenges we have now requires that understanding of the interrelationships and the breakdown of the international and the domestic policy spheres. Thank you. Uh, I am actually at the last mile of project implementation also. Right? Uh, currently, my division is dealing with about 600 projects in about 67 countries. So obviously, you can see that we are dealing with very different clients around the world. So our approach has been that First, let's understand what they want, how we can deliver it. Right? So somewhere, this itself is where the foreign policy kicks in. You have to know that you cannot just say that, OK, this is what I offer and come and take it. You can't do that. You have to go handhold, develop them. Right? So there are some countries which cannot really, uh, I call it project landing. They don't have a project landing space. We have to create that project landing space also. Right? So this is one area. Another is, as my co-panelist said, that uh, we have to now balance what is domestic, India's SDGs, and then the global SDG to which India is contributing. How do you do that? For example, uh, another initiative, as I said, International Solar Alliance, we also have CDRI, which is for disaster resilient infrastructure. I'm also the chair, India's chair of Quad Infrastructure Coordination Group. Right? So wherever I go, I see another angle which needs some focus is that how do you count? Right? There, is a, there is a gap. I think foreign policy practitioners will obviously identify that. How do you count? How do you take this into this? Right? One project is contributing to many things. How do you count? And you count differently. Out, I count differently. What do you count? All these things are now getting very relevant. Right? I see that some of the countries that I'm dealing with, the database is very weak. They cannot deliver something that what you want. So we have to work on that also. Now, as I said, we are also going into another area where we think that foreign policy is, I normally say that development partnership is about relationship. It's not project management. It's relationship management. So a relationship management will have a very long-term perspective about it. Right? So what do you do? Now what we are trying to do is that if I do a school somewhere, I am actually offering them, can I train your people? Or if I do a hospital somewhere, can I train your people to run the hospital? Or can I put somebody to run it for a few years? Right? So we are jumping deep into it. All the things are flowing from the foreign policy perspective. How it is not a start to finish that, OK, you cut the ribbon and come out. It's the relationship that you are going to hold it. So that, that <laughs> sentiment comes from the foreign policy itself. Now, how do you fine tune in selecting the projects correctly? How do you balance? Because every country has limitations of what you can offer in terms of development assistance. Where do you balance it? India is actually one of the few countries which is actually getting into a hardcore infrastructure development issue. Right? Uh, many countries have moved on to capacity building area, but we are still in the infrastructure area also. We do capacity building here also. So now we have a full bouquet of offers. But all the bouquet, everything in the bouquet is flowing from our foreign policy. So in that way, I think we have to know fine tune from the beginning. What are you going to contribute? How do you balance it? How do you sustain it? So that is where the foreign policy kicks in. Thank you. Um, it's hard to add after my <laughs> two uh, colleagues. D let's say um, so foreign policy is a, is a vehicle to uh, um, reach the SDGs. And, and at the same time, the SDGs are a challenge for foreign policy. You have SDGs create, uh, f achieving SDGs, moving towards SDGs, create opportunities for foreign policy, but it also can create difficulties that foreign policy needs to address because moving in that direction will create uh, transitions and power redistribution and changes and transformation that have consequences. And these consequences don't have to be geopolitical. I also mentioned why they will be also geopolitical, but, uh, and, and so, that, that is also when I think uh, uh, partnerships uh, come in. 
um, uh, and partnerships, it's, I, th I think France has uh, uh, learned a lot recently and is still learning about working with more and more uh, partners from the private sector, um, uh, from NGOs, from foundations, uh, philanthropic foundations, from uh, local governments, which was not necessarily the tradition of the French uh, foreign policy, uh, but we are uh, quite committed uh, in that front. I think uh, what we did when we prepared for the um, um, COP21 uh, uh, in Paris was a big uh, uh, accelerator of our learning curve, and since then we've tried to, to capitalize uh, on, on this. Um, but there is also, it's not just about having a wider range of interlocutors, it's also the logic that you are looking for through this uh, partnership. And one example I can take maybe is the uh, connectivity uh, strategy. The EU connectivity strategy is a big part of uh, uh, our policy, the so-called global gateways. Uh, program that Ursula von der Leyen spoke about when she was uh, opening the Raisina Dialogue this year. Um, and she insisted, and rightly so, uh, that our view of what we want to achieve with connectivity through the global gateways actually includes a lot of connectivity between countries, not just between these countries and us. Mm -hmm. And that is a different approach to uh, it. And it's also, as, as a diplomat, but as a policy planner, maybe less into projects than, uh, than my colleague, um, I, I think it is an important contribution to the idea that what we want to do is to, to give options and to keep options open for the people and for countries. And that's, I think, a good summary of what the Indo-Pacific strategy is, at least for France and, and for the European Union, that you have this idea that this is a space where you need to help the people and the countries that live there, including French people because of the French territories uh, in the region, um, to have their options open. And connectivity and partnerships are part of what is going to help to keep this optionality rather than being uh, uh, bound to make choices and take sides and, uh, and cut your options. Thank you. And my last question, and we need to do this rather quickly. Uh, how can countries leverage their own experience and partnerships to pursue both their national interest and help in achieving sustainable development goals? So this, I hope, will be what we look back in five years' time and say there was an innovation that we really made the most of. So um, I, know I firmly believe that we now need to drop this north-south divide question and talk much more about how do we get the most of each other's shared experiences. Um, and it's not a sort of um, a hubristic national identity issue. It is simply the case that many countries through their own development journey, you know, the, the UK, European countries, Western countries, um, and through their own expertise and their investment, have centers of excellence that are relevant as much in the UK and in developed countries as they, as they are, or at least can be applied to the developing. So health research, emerging technologies, climate change research, um, you know, uh, some of our best and most innovative work has been on crop or drought resistant seeds which work globally. They don't just have to work in one country or another. So being able to share research, being able to share ideas, being able to share experience. You know, the UK has a fantastic financial centre which is a sort of centre of excellence that we want to use internationally as part of our brand to help other countries leverage finance. You know, these are all things which matter to all of us and where we can share experience and learning. In India, actually, we have this advantage of just growing up a ladder, right? So we know what the countries are going through, and so we have been there just immediately, so we can offer the solution. At the same time, India is growing so fast that you can actually touch some areas the other countries do not have. So we normally say that when I share my experience, I'm not sharing a point of my experience, I'm sharing a range of my experience. What it means, for example, when the UK Prime Minister recently visited. Both India and UK, we have jointly launched a fund which will take India's innovative solutions to third world countries. For example, say, uh, sorry, third countries. For example, Africa and these countries where we can actually give India's innovation in digital technology, right? But it's a jointly leveraging. So now India is leveraging its experience with the partner country in a third country. As she said, this is the time for innovation. If you see what Indian Development Partnership has done in the last two years, I have a paper called uh, 
despite COVID, okay? Despite COVID, we have done many things, right? And almost 60% of them were never done before because you have to rethink how, what we did in uh, our vaccinations, how we use the development partnership platform to give vaccinations to more than 100 countries in a very, very, very tight situation where normal things would not do. At the same time, we thought that if a water plant is coming, if agriculture plant is coming, I cannot delay it. Agriculture cannot wait for three years for me. So I have to innovate something. So we leveraged our experience. At the same time, we leveraged other countries' experience and our relationship. And we said, OK, can we go ahead and do this? Right? So that is where we are coming that we have to now, it's like going to be a Zoom of foreign policy where Zoom technology existed before, but we didn't really exploit it fully. Now, innovation in development for partnership is going to be the Zoom of foreign policy. We are going to innovate very quickly. We are going to iterate, learn very fast, make your mistakes very fast, learn very fast, and deliver quickly. So that is the way I see it. Thank you. Um, and try to be quick too. Um, I'd, I'd love to believe that the north-south divide uh, has, uh, has reduced. Sometimes I, I wonder if that is the case. Uh, and, and certainly this is something that we should work on further. Um, and, and part of that has to do with um, taking initiatives to address the most pressing uh, issues of the day and do it jointly. That's how you also you share experience, not just because you have experience and you give it to others, but because you're building something together. Uh, I could have mentioned the International Solar Alliance, which was launched by India and France, uh, but since it's been mentioned, um, uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, things that France uh, has done, uh, for instance, on COVID with ACTA, the uh, accelerator of COVID tools. Uh, which was uh, uh, meant to boost research for vaccine. Then there was COVAX, which was uh, uh, meant to uh, promote and push for uh, vaccine access uh, and not just buying doses, but actually delivering them. And we know that this is still an issue in some countries, uh, delivering them to the people who need to have the shot. Um, and now I think one of the talk uh, uh, at this Resina dialogue session was food insecurity. We see that uh, that was there before the Ukraine war. It's even more pressing because of the consequences of this war of aggression by Russia against Ukraine. Um, and uh, there is this French initiative called FARM, Food and Agricultural Resilience Mission, which is not very different from ACTA and from uh, uh, COVAX, which is basically not just trying to address jointly uh, um, the solidarity uh, phase, the emergency assistance, uh, uh, but also try to look at how market works, how, how resilient they are, the transparency, the stocks, the pricing, and also at the production, increase the capacities for local production, which is not very different, again, from what we did uh, uh, on vaccine. And one of the common points of all these initiatives, including the International Solar Islands, is that they are multilateral, but truly multilateral. They take people around and they try to uh, uh, get the best from uh, uh, everyone's experience and they are backed on this big multilateral system which is a good experience sharing, should be a good experience sharing mechanism and at a time when big power competition takes so much space and could overflow maybe over cooperation, I think it's important that we focus also on this multilateral level and not just the relationships that we have bilaterally between our, our countries. Thank you so much. That's it from us.